Okay, hello, Ling341. We're back for another episode of Intro Linguistics. And today we're going to talk about airstream mechanisms, yet another dimension of constant articulation and sort of the foundational um, dimension of co constant articulation because every single sound we make in language has to involve the flow of air somehow. And the way we get that flow of air started is what, I re what I'm referring to when I say airstream mechanisms. Um, so how do we push air around into the world, both inside and outside of our mouth? Um, okay, so the study of airflow scientifically, which I talked about last time, is called aerodynamics. Um, and so as I pointed out here and mentioned just a second ago, all sounds are created by the flow of air, including all speech sounds. And all of the speech sounds that we've looked at so far in English uh, and otherwise have a pulmonic egressive airstream mechanism. Uh, and as I mentioned um, a couple times ago, that just basically means that air is being pushed out of the lungs. So pulmonic means lungs and then egressive means out of. Uh, so we'll take a tour of the world's airstream mechanisms today and I'm going to keep score as we do so. But basically all the different airstream me mechanisms we talk about um, can be broken down into a distinction between egressive, which means out of, uh, and ingressive, which means into. So um, Egressive in this particular case just basically means that you're pushing air out of your mouth and the mover of that airstream is your lungs. So that's what I mean by pulmonic in this particular case. So I'm going to keep score here on this little spreadsheet uh, and the opposite sort of uh, half of this equation is ingressive where um, air could flow into your mouth in this particular case. So egressive and pulmonic, uh, a basic example of that kind of sound that we've talked about is like a T. Um, a regular stop, right? Uh, and so, yeah, we talked about stops as well as sort of like a very basic aerodynamic method. Um, so you have air flowing up out of your lungs, um, out through your mouth into the world around you, and then you can stop that airflow by bringing two articulators together. Uh, for a T, you'd bring your the tip of your tongue up to the alveolar ridge, uh, and you'd close off the mouth from the outside world, and that would stop the airflow. And then you can release that closure, and then airflow can um, go back through your mouth, and it may create a burst of air as it does so, uh, a release burst and maybe some aspiration after it. Um, that is not super crucial uh, for our particular cases, because what we actually want to think about in this particular case is the first stage in this process. So how do we start airflow even before it gets into our mouth uh, and we can stop it up with our tongue or whatever articulator we happen to be using? How do we get air moving to begin with? Um, and yeah, you can say, well, okay, uh, I'm doing something with my lungs, but I want you to think even more broadly or more abstractly than that in terms of airflow. Uh, I want to kind of frame this within like the basic principles of physics, uh, how those affect the motion of air in one direction or no another. So uh, with that, I'm gonna uh, let you know that you can create air different, or you can get you can create airflow by creating differences in air pressure. That's how it basically all begins. And there's a basic principle here, and maybe I'll keep score with this too because this will become crucial later. But air is going to flow naturally from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. And I'm gonna write that down, and I'd encourage you. Uh, to write that down too because when you keep in mind these basic principles you can kind of figure out what's going on to create all these different airstream mechanisms in speech so as air is going to flow from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure um yeah <laughs> i have a balloon in my class i normally don't have a balloon in class um but i might as well bring it out as a prop I have a two-year-old who uh, is currently terrified of balloons. So uh, we have, if we get them, we like have all this hope. They're like, oh, she might like the balloon. And then she's terrified, and then so we have to hide it. So this one has been in my closet in my office here. Uh, but yeah, it's there's more pressure inside this balloon than there is outside of it. I mean, it's starting to lose pressure over time, uh, and it's not helium inside of it. It's you know air, so it's not going to float. But um, if I were to pop it, then air would flow out of this balloon into the world around it, rather than air flowing into the balloon. Um, I don't really have anything good I can pop this with, or do I? Maybe I have a pencil or a pen. Never done this demo. And if this takes too long, I am just gonna cut it out. But give me a second. 
Yeah. We're gonna get a little violent here. So, um, goodbye, plume. Yeah. Okay, that didn't happen. This <laughs> didn't work out as well as I thought it did. So this is why you should always test demos or at least um, practice them once before you do them in class. But uh, <laughs> uh, I felt the puff of air when I popped that balloon, as you might imagine. Uh, I was hoping the thing would kind of go all the way around the room, but maybe I should have just untied it instead. Uh, anyways, there's more air pressure in one area um, and there's less air pressure in the other. Um, the air is going to flow from that high pressure to low pressure. In a balloon, those areas get cut off by the balloon itself. Uh, so the air can't flow through that membrane. Uh, but if you think like in terms of like the weather, um, you have like high pressure systems and low pressure systems, the air is going to flow from high pressure to low pressure uh, because there's nothing really blocking it in the atmosphere, right? That's how we get wind. Uh, I felt a little bit of wind when that balloon popped in my face. I can only blame myself for that, but that's, you know, airflow is wind. Uh, the question we need to think about uh, in terms of this class uh, or, you know, in terms of um, sort of starting airflow is how do we make these air pressure differences? Uh, what is the basic setup that we need in order to get more air pressure in one spot and less air pressure in another spot so we can get air flowing between them? Um, yeah, I'm going to take a brief drink of water after that ridiculousness. And maybe you can think of the answer. But we're going to take advantage of something called Boyle's Law in order to do this. So Boyle's Law um, is named after this guy, Robert Boyle, who lived in the 17th century in, I believe, England, or at least somewhere in the British Isles, uh, so-called. But um, he didn't actually discover this, it turns out. He was actually just the first guy to publish it. So uh, he gets all the credit for it many hundreds of years later. Uh, and that's just a lesson for those of you about publishing if you're going into research. But what Boyle's Law says is that a uh, constant quantity of gas, i.e. At, at a constant temperature, so like in a chamber like a balloon or something like that where there's no way for the gas to escape, we're going to get this relationship. So the pressure of the gas in that chamber is going to be inversely proportional to the volume of gas in the chamber. <clears throat> there's a trade-off between the two. And hopefully this makes intuitive sense. Um, I don't, again, have anything I can kind of squeeze here for this. Um, yeah, I do. Lo and behold, I didn't plan any of this. Um, this is just the way my office is organized. Uh, so let's say, um, yeah, here's our chamber of air. This is a little foot pump for like inflating a raft or something. Uh, and the idea is that <clears throat> there's this trade off between how much pressure there is inside the chamber um, and how big the chamber is. So yeah, there's no way to kind of close this off, but there's a certain amount of air in this chamber and if I compress it, the pressure will increase. So if I decrease the volume, the pressure is going to increase inside this chamber. Decrease, increase pressure, increase the volume, then I'm going to decrease the pressure inside of the chamber. Uh, so that goes by this ratio here, where P representing pressure equals some constant K divided by V, the volume of the chamber. And this is another way to say that uh, without variables, but just the actual entities themselves. But we'll write this down as well, so you can hopefully remember it a little bit better, with or without me popping a balloon. But, sorry, don't do that. Yeah, the pressure of the gas is inversely proportional to the volume of gas in the chamber. Yeah, and then we could call this Boyle's Law because that's what everybody else calls it. And there you go. Now you have a little handy way to remember that. And this is what I was saying before with my little foot pump here. So if I want to increase, or yeah, if I want to change how much pressure there is in this chamber, if I want to change how much air pressure there's, there is in this chamber, then I increase or decrease the volume. And I can do that directly, right? So the pressure um, is being indirectly changed by my changes of the volume of that chamber. Uh, and basically the way it works is that if you decrease 
the volume of the chamber, it increases the pressure. And in this particular case, you can hear that. It's a nice little demo uh, because uh, there is a little escape valve, right, for the air. That's the whole point of this thing. Um, so when I increase the pressure inside the chamber, there's higher pressure here than there is outside of the chamber. So air escapes through this long tube, um, ideally into something that you want to inflate, right? And at this point, if uh, I have decreased the volume of the chamber uh, and the air has escaped, then when I increase it, there's actually a little bit of air that's going to flow back into it uh, because the pressure will decrease inside of here uh, so that the air pressure will be higher outside and go back in through the tube into my little foot pump. Um, you kind of have to design it so it doesn't totally work that way, but um, generally speaking, that's the idea. This is nice. This is basically a bellows. Uh, and you can kind of think of your lungs is working the same way, right? So when we have pulmonic aggressive sounds, we want to have air flowing out of our lungs into the environment. And our lungs, there's nothing special about them physically, uh, other than the fact that they give us life. But uh, physics doesn't care about that. So what physics does care about is basically the volume of the lungs. If you want to be able to push air outside of your lungs into the environment, outside of your mouth, then you have to decrease the volume of your lungs. That will increase the pressure inside of your lungs. And then as long as there's an escape valve for that increased air pressure, it will flow out of your mouth, right? Um, that's basically the idea, right? Uh, I don't think I'm going to write all this over and over again, but that's the trade-off is that like smaller volume, increased pressure, increased volume, lower pressure. That's the connection. They work in the opposite direction of each other. So the comprehension question for this, I think you just saw a second ago, but if I want to get a pulmonic ingress of sound, what do I need to do to the lungs to make that happen? I will take a short break. <clears throat> And hopefully you can figure it out. Um, but it's sort of like I'm at this point with my lungs or my bellows and I need to increase the volume so that air will flow into the system rather than flowing out. So to get a pulmonic ingress of sound, I need to increase the volume of my lungs. Air pressure will go, go down inside here and then air will flow into my mouth, hopefully creating some sort of sound. Um, yeah, so um, I'll give you some examples of pulmonic ingressive sounds. Actually, we can kind of try this. I, I tried this a second ago. Uh, maybe I can try to read one of these sentences on the slide. Uh, but if I say pressure can be increased or decreased by changing the volume of the chamber, that was all pulmonic egressive. If I want to read that pulmonic ingressively, I would say pressure can be increased. <laughs> pressure can be increased. Yeah, it's hard to keep going, right? There's limits on how big you can make your lungs in order to help them sort of expand to get air pressure down inside there. But Pressure can be increased. Yeah, that's how you do it, basically. And surprisingly, or I guess not that surprisingly, there's not that many languages in the world that um, actually use this sort of airstream mechanism in speech because it's hard to do. Uh, I think I mentioned last time or a couple times ago that some people have reported like their grandmas in Nova Scotia or something on when they're on the phone and they want to agree with something, will say like, yep, 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 yep like that pulmonic aggressively. So like one word or something like that might have that sort of stylized airstream mechanism to it. Um, there's a bigger question about whether or not this is sort of a general phonetic feature that's used in languages or any language. Uh, and I've got an interesting little story here from the 1980s, um, which is um, about a language called Tso, which is spoken in Southern Taiwan. Uh, and people made the claim back then that it used pulmonic ingressive sounds. And I've got some samples of the supposedly pulmonic ingressive sounds in the language. Uh, and the way it's represented here, there's no like official diacritic for this in the IPA. Uh, so this, um, Ooh. sorry, transcription uses this little greater than symbol here, um, which you're welcome to go ahead and use uh, if you ever encounter this yourself out there in the great big world of language. Uh, but this is a couple of recorded samples where we've got a pulmonic egressive F compared to a pulmonic ingressive F. And maybe you can hear the difference. So here we go. Uh, this is a velar fricative, like that sound. All right, and then here's our ingressives. It's kind of like that sort of sound. Maybe. Uh, here's a pulmonic ingressive H and a pulmonic egressive H. Hipsy. Ishy. And that's basically like breathing in, right? 
<laughs> something like that. Um, yeah, so uh, the funny part of this is that in the 90s, after the headstrong era of the 80s, um, the existence of these segments was disputed uh, by a couple of phoneticians, one of whom was Peter Latifoged, who wrote uh, the textbook for this class. Uh, and so what they did is something kind of funny. Uh, they went out into the field in Taiwan to kind of test this. Uh, and I guess they didn't have sort of like sophisticated airflow equipment that they were able to bring with them. Um, maybe it was too heavy to lug around or something. So they tested the claim instead with these two methods. Uh, first, they had speakers inhale smoke before making the sounds, I guess if they were cigarette smokers or something like that. Uh, and then the second uh, option was to place a straw in the speaker's mouth with the other end of the straw in a dark liquid like coffee or something like that. And then the idea with number two, well, with number one, the idea was, well, they inhale smoke and then they um, you know, say something. Uh, will smoke come out of their mouth or not? If it's egress, if it will, if it's ingress, if it won't. Uh, and then number two, if they have a straw in the speaker's mouth with the other end of the straw in dark liquid, if it's egressive, they should see bubbles in the dark liquid. Uh, and if it's ingressive, they shouldn't. Actually, when I stop and think about this, I feel like, you know, maybe just use method number two for everybody. But what they found was that uh, they got smoke being exhaled during the production of the sounds for method number one. And then they also had bubbles appearing in the liquid for method number two supposedly for all but one speaker. So there was one guy who like legitimately was using pulmonic aggressive sounds in this language. And I don't know if that was the first guy that was discovered doing this and that was where the claim was made or what have you. Uh, but there is at least one speaker in the world who consistently uses this airstream mechanism, uh, or at least there was back in 1993. Um, and maybe there's more now, who knows? Maybe it's you know, taken off and it's a trend. That being said, uh, I have found other research uh, on the topic which has gone and found pulmonic aggressive like individual sounds or individual words in a lot of different languages, like the yep, 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 kind of example I was giving you before. So in a limited way, lots of languages can use this, uh, but in a sort of systematic way as like a feature of um, just constant articulation, it's not that common or maybe hardly existent at all to use the pulmonic ingressive airstream mechanism. Uh, but that being said, I will try to keep score here and put this on our little spreadsheet. So I, as I mentioned before, there's no official way to do this in the IPA. So I'm hoping this works. Yeah, so I've got a little um, kind of subscript parentheses, <laughs> parenthesis underneath that F there to kind of give you the same representation that was used in that slide. Uh, so instead of the greater than symbol, just a little parenthesis, but it looks almost the same, right? Especially if you don't zoom in. Uh, anyways, that's our, our pulmonic ingressive sound. And maybe I should put that in parentheses in general because maybe it's a legit thing and maybe it's not. Okay, so there we go. What's next? Where can we go from there? What other Airstream mechanisms can we actually use or the languages do actually consistently use? So it's also possible to move air in and out of the vocal tract without moving air in and out of the lungs. So in that little table, I've broken things down into egressive and ingressive. And then our first mover of the airstream was the lungs, the pulmonic airstream mechanisms, but that's not the only one you can use. Uh, so I'll give you another method. And I often uh, will write this out on the board as I'm walking through the steps uh, in class, but you can write this down at home if you want. So, and you can also try this as I'm walking you through the method in your own mouth. So the first step is to close the glottis. So you make a glottal stop down here, bring your vocal folds together basically holding your breath. Number two, you can make a stop closure above the glottis somewhere. Let's pick a T or a P or whatever. Um, so I'm gonna raise the tip of my tongue after doing this. Number three, oh yeah, so importantly, the thing about these two closures are gonna close off a chamber of air above the glottis, right? Between my teeth or my alveolar ridge and the vocal folds down here, there's just a certain amount of air It's we're gonna hold constant in terms of its um, the amount that's in there. Uh, so Boyle's law is gonna apply in this particular case. And so what I need to do to get air moving is to change the pressure of the air in that chamber. And the way I'm gonna be able to change the pressure of the air inside that chamber is by changing the volume or the size of that chamber. Okay, how am I going to change the volume in that chamber? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna raise the glottis that will decrease that volume of the chamber of air above my glottis which will drive up the air pressure. Volume goes down, 
air pressure goes up. Number four, I'm going to release the stop closure in front of the glottis. So that T closure I had, the alveolar closure, I'll release that. And because now I have higher air pressure inside my mouth than I had before, it's going to be higher in pressure than the outside, the air in the outside world. So when I release that T closure, air is going to rush out of the vocal tract from high pressure to low pressure. These basic principles always apply. And number five, what I'm going to do is release the glottal closure. So air will rush out of the lungs if I've got any pushed up there. And that's going to make what sounds like a glottal stop. So I'm going to get basically two stop releases here. Uh, the second of which is always going to be a glottal closure. And the first is going to be a stop somewhere further forward in your mouth, which is basically going to be a stop that's made while you're holding your breath. So it's going to have a distinctive sound to it. The technical term for this is that we're making glottalic egressive stops or sounds. Um, and I'll put that on the scoreboard. And we'll say it's glottalic. And that just means that you're going to be like changing air pressure with your glottis. And if it's egressive, the symbol we use is that. Um, it's actually usually a little curly cue, but it's basically that. And it sounds like this. That's my T. Um, my glottalic egressive T. So like I said, I'm making that T sound while holding my breath. So I can actually make kind of this whole series of stop sounds like that. And they're all made with the same airstream mechanism. I just got to keep my glottis moving. And I don't know if you can see my glottis moving up and down, my larynx moving up and down, uh, but I'll give it a shot. Yeah, it doesn't have to move much to change the air pressure to make this happen, um, but it does. And the other nickname or name for this is that these are ejectives. So you kind of think of it like I'm ejecting air out of my mouth with my larynx or my glottis. Uh, so that's where that name comes from. Uh, like I said, these are symbolized with this little apostrophe after the symbol for the stop. Um, so I'll give you some examples of Peter Latifoged producing these. Uh, uh. Up, uh. Or uh, uh. Uh, uh. Uh, uh. Um, yeah, and this might be a little bit tricky to start off with uh, in terms of you producing it yourself. Um, some people kind of just dive in and get that. Others um, have to work out a little bit. But the basic ex advice I would give you is um, hold your breath and make a P or a T or a K. Uh, and the only tricky part of it really is that you have to hold your breath in the middle of like two vowels. So like not appa, but appa, 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 appa. And you can really, if you want to, get into it and like expel air out of your mouth, right? Um, even though you're just pushing with your glottis. Yeah. Um, so that's my advice for those as well. Uh, I've got this now dated joke about Elaine from Seinfeld. He used to say, yep, like that. Uh, whenever she would agree with something. So if you know Seinfeld, then maybe you can imitate that as well. Either way, um, the easiest way to do this is to kind of have fun with it. Uh, so here's a language which has contrastive ejectives. Um, actually, before I do this, I'm gonna put ejectives here in our score sheet, like that. Um, and then I'll get play some examples of these from Quechua. Uh, so adjectives are found in about 18% of the world's languages. That's about one out of six, which is pretty good. Uh, and Quechua has them. We've talked about Quechua before. It's spoken down in South America. Um, and it has unaspirated versus aspirated stops and affricates. And then it also has an ejective series of the same types of sounds, including uvular stops, which is fun. So let's do the velars first. That might be the easiest one to start off with. Kuyui. Kuyui. And try this at home. It's the best way to learn it. Kuyui. 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 Kayu. Kailu. Yeah, and you got to push your tongue back there. I don't know if I really did on that one. Kayu. Kailu. Kayu. Kailu. Kayu. Kailu. Uh, we can try the post alveolars. Chaka. 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 And I'll point out with this one, um, it's a little bit weird to have like an aspirate. It might seem a little bit weird to have an aspirated affricate like this. Um, you just kind of have to have the ch and then a huh after it. Same way you have like a voiceless stop here and then a little puff of air. Kuyui. Kuyui. 
Uh, you just got to kind of open up your vocal tract enough to uh, get a uh, right after the ch. Chaka. 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 And you can emphasize it here. It's it's fine uh, when you're just trying to learn. Same way you would emphasize like this ejective. Chaka. Chaka. Kuyui. Kuyui. Ayu. Ayu. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of fun. Uh, I have some deep thought questions, though, to ask you about ejectives before we move on to the next airstream mechanism. And maybe you can answer them for me. So, number one, do you think it's possible to make a voiced ejective? The answer is no, you cannot make a voice ejective. Um, so I don't really lay out the reasons why here, but the first step, if you remember, is that you have to close your glottis to close off a chamber of air inside your mouth. So if that glottis is not closed, then air might, and air is running through it to make a voiced ejective, then you're not really not gonna get an ejective. You really can't create the air pressure differences necessary to create the sound. Something different will happen, it turns out. Um, so, yeah, the problem is with voicing and ejectives, it kind of creates a system that violates Boyle's law or where Boyle's law no longer applies. Uh, question number two, do you think it's easier to make an ejective at some places of articulation than others? And hopefully you've been following along in the slides here and singing along at home, and maybe you've gotten a sense that some of these might be easier than others. If so, which place do you think is easiest um, or what places do you think are easier? I'll let you think about that for a second. I'll ponder over the ruins of my balloon here. At least my child won't be upset. And I will let you know that there are, or there is data about this that we get from the UPSID database. And it turns out that out of those 317 languages in that database, three, 34 of those languages have bilabial ejectives. So about one out of 10. 50 have alveolar ejectives. And seven have palatal ejectives. 70 have velar ejectives, and there's actually even 27 that have uvular ejectives. So it looks like there's a trend such that we're getting more ejectives the further back we go in the mouth. Um, so a lot of velars and less bilabials, and alveolars are kind of somewhere in between. And then a surprising amount of uvular ejectives, even though we don't have that many languages that have uvular stops in general. But like Quechua itself, uh, we get uvular ejectives in that language, like in 26 others. Okay, so why is that? Why might it be easier to get uh, an ejective further back in your mouth? Um, and kind of the way to rationalize it, and this is kind of hard to prove in reality, but it's to think about what kind of chamber of air you're creating with these two steps in the process. So you close off the glottis to begin with, then you make a stop closure above the glottis, if you make a stop closure further back, like a K, like a velar stop closure, you're getting a smaller chamber of air back here. So when you do raise your glottis to increase the pressure of that chamber of air, you're going to proportionally increase it more dramatically when you make that step, such that the air pressure will increase even further or percentage-wise more than it would than if you had like a bilabial closure and a larger chamber of air that you could kind of compress less percentage-wise. Uh, so that may give you like stronger airflow when you finally release that forward closure so that more air will flow out, out of uh, the ejective closure when you open it uh, and it will give you sort of a more or stronger um, acoustic signal to somebody who might be listening. That is kind of the most likely explanation for this. Um, like I said, it's a bit hard to sort of actually establish that scientifically, but it probably has to do with the size of the chamber and the fact that there's a trade-off between size and pressure according to Boyle's law in this situation. Okay, uh, I'm going to take a deep, or uh, not a deep breath, why not? But uh, I'm gonna take a brief break uh, and come right back with the next airstream mechanism, which is closely related to ejectives. All right, we're back for part two. And as you might expect, the kind of flip side of a glottalic egressive is going to be a glottalic ingressive. Uh, and these, it turns out, are more viable as speech sounds than pulmonic ingressive sounds. Uh, and they're actually made in a fairly similar way to glottalic egressives, but there's some crucial differences between the two. So um, you probably already know how to make these, uh, I'm guessing. There are a few sort of weird expressions in English that use them, um, but I'll walk you through the mechanics of how they work. So here's how you do it. Number one, make a stop closure 
above the glottis this time. So again, we can think about like a bilabial or an alveolar stop closure, take your pick. Uh, and then number two, you bring together the vocal folds, um, but you're not gonna close the vocal folds tightly like you did before for the ejectives. So we're gonna again have a closed chamber of air somewhere in between the glottis and wherever our stop closure is. Uh, and so we can manipulate the pressure, the air pressure in that chamber of air by manipulating the volume of the chamber of air according to Boyle's law. And the way we're gonna do that is that we're going to lower the glottis this time. So before we raise the glottis to increase air pressure above the larynx, now we're gonna lower the glottis to decrease air pressure above the larynx because we're increasing the volume of that chamber, right? So the weird part of this, or the part we didn't get before, is that because the vocal folds aren't going to be closed as tightly, uh, they're, you're gonna get some voicing as you lower the glottis in this particular case. So air can rush through the two vocal folds as you do this, and you get some voicing as you increase that air pressure, or as you decrease that air pressure slightly above the larynx or above the glottis. Um, so that's what these two steps are about. We're getting voicing, we're getting decreased air pressure, and then lastly, you release that stop closure above the glottis. And because there is less air pressure inside the mouth than there was before, air is going to rush into your mouth from high pressure outside your mouth to lower pressure inside your mouth. So you're gonna get a combination of voicing and then air rushing in. Um, that's going to be the ingressive part of this and the glottalic part is the lowering of the glottis to get this whole thing going. So those are glottalic ingressive sounds and they're also known as implosives. So I'll put that in um, the uh, score sheet here. I actually didn't look up before I started this what our symbol was for that. Maybe I'll do a, this one. A, uh, uh, that's what they sound like. Is that going to work? Yeah, it's just going to be too big. Um, yep, so there's our symbol. And the nickname is that these are called implosives. So it's sort of like the world of your mouth is imploding in on itself <laughs> because air is rushing in on it rather than air being pushed out. There's no explosion of air into the world. There's an implosion of air into your mouth. And it sounds like ba, da, ga, so on and so forth. Um, I've got some examples here of Peter Latifoga trying to make the same sound. All of these sounds as they're transcribed just look like kind of the voiced stop version with this little curly Q kind of on, uh, uh. on the top. Sorry about that. Either it's a b, da, or ga. And again, here's Peter trying to produce the same sounds. Uh, ma, uh, da, uh, ga. And I don't know if you can see my glottis moving down when I do this because it goes by pretty quick, but I'll just kind of speak up like this so to give it the best shot possible. A ba, a da, a ga, a ba, da, ga, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, so. I'll play these again, and then we'll you'll hear a few more examples too. These uh, tend to be a lot trickier for students to pick up on for production exercises I've found over the years. So uh, what I would recommend is kind of focusing on that first step or maybe the first couple of steps. Uh, not this one. Um, so these two are no problem, right? Making a stop closure, just you know, put your tongue against the roof of your mouth or what have you, and then bring, bring together the vocal folds. Uh, what you want to focus on here is the voicing part. So uh, you know you know you're not going to be opening the stop closure yet. You want to get the voicing going before that happens. Um, and so if you have a closed chamber of air above your glottis um, and you start to voice it, you can run into a problem where you just kind of like stop voicing. I'll explain the aerodynamic reasons for that in another lecture. But b b b. If you try that, you know you might notice you can't really keep that going forever. You can't like keep pushing air through your vocal folds forever into your mouth because there's nowhere for it to go basically. Buh, buh. Um, and so maybe I'll take my tips, fingertips away from my larynx, but if I go buh, 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 like that and really try to focus on that voicing while that stop closure is held, um, what my body is going to do is kind of naturally lower that glottis to begin with, because that's one way to kind of keep the appropriate air pressure differential to keep that airflow going through the voice, uh, the vocal folds. So, buh, buh, 
uh, really focus on that voicing. And if you want to, you can put your fingertips around your larynx as I, as I was doing before. And you should be able to feel that larynx lower. Uh, 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 kind of around your two fingertips. It should go down to give you that kind of weird uh, quality of a sound for uh, an implosive. Uh, uh, that sort of air is now going into my mouth, not out of my mouth anymore. Um, yeah, so with that in mind, focus closely on voicing these guys and you should be able to get this effect. Try it at home. Here's some examples from the language Sindhi, which is spoken in India. And we've seen this language before because it has retroflex stops and also palatal stops. And on top of sort of the five different places of articulation, it has three different airstreams or I guess phonation types you would say. So it has voiceless, voiced, and then implosives, which is kind of fun. Um, I don't wanna make it too tricky for you by playing these new places of articulation, which you may or may not be familiar with uh, or used to producing yourself, I guess. So I'll just focus on sort of the velars and the bilabials here. Gunnu. 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 Uh, so yeah, there's a retroflex nasal in here. Uh, we can also listen to the bilabials. Bunnu. Bunnu. Bunny. Yeah, uh, I think there's a good example though here over on the velars uh, where you can kind of nicely hear the difference between just a regular voiced stop and an implosive voiced stop. Gunnu. 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 Uh, Gunnu. Gunnu. You can kind of think of that as like just a difference in how dramatic the stop is. So if you're making like a really dramatic voiced stop, you get an implosive. Bunny. Bunny. Dinu. Dinu. Get to. Get to. That one's a little tricky. Gunnu. Gunnu. Um, yeah. So like I said, you probably know how to produce these. Um, there are some dialect regions of uh, American English where people produce these kind of characteristically, like in the South or some portions of the Midwest. Um, but like I said, there are these weird expressions. Oh yeah, so I'll give an example of like from the South, uh, somebody from Alabama might say, Bama, Bama. Um, that's where I'm from, I'm from Bama, Bama, like that. Or uh, there's this expression that uh, we used to use when I was a kid. Uh, like if something obvious was stated, then you'd say, duh. Duh, like that. Duh. Uh, or if you want to caricaturize somebody swallowing, you can say. <laughs> I started that out with not too much air in my mouth, uh, so it didn't go very far. But you can try it at home. <laughs> yeah, like that. Uh, it's hard to do these things on top of giving a lecture. Um, I had a, a student a while back who was from the American South who um, actually produced these just uh, for her production exercises. Beak. Beak. And hopefully you can hear that. That's an implosive at the beginning of that one. Beak. Um, it's kind of subtle because it still falls into the category of voice stops for us uh, if you're a native English speaker, but that's what it is. Beak. Beak. Bayama. So on and so forth. Uh, okay, so uh, we can think about implosives, uh, what limitations or patterns there might be in the implosives we find in the world. They occur about in about 10% of the world's languages, so not quite as common as ejectives. Um, you can also think, well, would some places of articulation be more conducive to making implosives than others? Um, I'll put that out there for you. And I'll let you know that the answer is yes. Uh, but it's maybe not the pattern you're thinking. Uh, for ejectives, we found that they're more frequent at backer places of articulation, at mo more posterior places of articulation. The implosives turn out uh, to be found more frequently at fronter places of articulation, closer to the front of the mouth. So we have 39 languages in the UPSID database with, which have bilabial implosives, 36 have alveolars. There's a lot fewer for palatals and velars, uh, and even fewer than that for the retroflexes and uvulars, which aren't super common anyways. So the implosives seem to like to be in the front of the mouth rather than the back. Um, and the reason why that uh, you get that pattern, which is like the, I said, the opposite of what you might expect based on what we said about ejectives, um, it turns out to be uh, kind of historical in nature uh, rather than just strictly about physics or aerodynamics. Um, and so I'll give you just, I'll explain that more in a future lecture, but basically I'll say that a lot of implosives uh, are derived historically from voiced stops. And for aerodynamic or physics reasons, there are just um, more commonly voice stops at fronter places of articulation than in backer places of articulation. So it's kind of an accident of history rather than uh, general truth about physics that's going taking place here. 
I don't want to dwell on that too long though, so I will move on and just let you know that this is the pattern we see here. Um, so our next question is, do you think it's possible to make a voiceless implosive? We have nothing but voice, voiceless ejectives. We can't have voiced ejectives. We have some voiced implosives. Can we get voiceless implosives? And it actually turns out that the answer is yes, but they are very rare. And in fact, they're only found in about three languages, um, last I checked. Uh, so the way this would work is that you kind of have to skip that step where you're truly voicing the stop. Um, so you're closing your glottis here. You're making another stop closure up above it. Um, and then when you push that glottis down to get that air pressure differential in your mouth, then as long as you keep those vocal folds tightly closed, you can get that implosion effect with air rushing into your mouth rather than rushing out. Um, so the, if the vocal fold closure is strong enough to prevent voicing from occurring, you can get a voiceless implosive. And I have an example of one language which does this. It's called Igbo. It's spoken in Nigeria. And as I found out uh, recently, there are Igbo speakers in Calgary as well, which is cool because this uh, language does this neat thing. So, um, this has, I've got examples of bilabials and alveolars, and this has basically six different phonation types here, including one we haven't really talked about, this breathy voiced sample. Uh, when you hear it, you'll know what's going on there, I think. But um, so first of all, we got voiced bilabial stops. Eva, Eva. It's a tone language as well, then voiceless. Eva. Aspirated. Eva. Breathy voiced, aspirated. Eva. Uh, a voiced implosive. Eva and then a voiceless implosive. Yeah, so that's pretty subtle. Um, I'll play all six of them again, and you can try to sing along if you want. Don't know if I can even try that one. Something like that. And here are the alveolars. And this is the voiceless implosive. So uh, my guess is that this voiceless implosive probably sounds a lot like the voiceless unaspirated stop. Ifa, ifa. Yeah, um, this one sounds like it's kind of like, you can get a sense that air is being pushed out a little bit more. It's kind of a stronger release burst on the stop than this one where it kind of sounds like it's imploding in. Ifa, ifa. Like that. Um, yeah, so that's there, it's possible. It's just not super common. Um, yeah, voiceless versus in, voice implosives. And the only way to sort of transcribe a voiceless implosive is to put that voiceless diacritic underneath the voiced implosive symbol. Okay, last but not least, uh, we have velaric ingressive sounds. So uh, maybe I'll start up the score sheet here um, and say that, well, we have a velaric or the potential for two types of velaric sounds um, or airstream mechanisms. Uh, and we're going to focus on the ingressive part of this equation because that's the one that we actually find in language. And the way this works is that, first of all, you need to make a stop closure at the velum with the back of your tongue, along with another stop closure somewhere in front of the velum. And this one in the back can be further back, maybe uvular, uh, if you want it to be like back here. Um, this diagram shows you it as its velar, um, which is the sort of more common way to describe this or understand how it's produced. So the crucial part of this here is that we've got a little chamber of air in between these two stop closures. And Boyle's law is going to apply as well. And we're gonna have the potential, I guess, for dramatic air pressure changes because this is starting off so small to begin with, right between two parts of your tongue, basically. So what do we do next? we change that air pressure by increasing the volume of that chamber. So we're going to lower the front of the tongue while keeping this stop closure stopped back here and also maintaining the stop closure in the front. Um, so that air pressure in the closed chamber will decrease because its volume has, you know, like more than doubled at this point. Uh, then you release that forward stop closure and then because air pressure has become so low in here and it stayed the same outside of your mouth, air is going to rush into your mouth from high pressure to low, as always. And because we get such a dramatic pressure differential um, across that boundary, we're going to get a loud clicking sound as you make that gesture. 
Um, so normally when I do this in class, I've already heard about 50 or 80 or 100 different clicking sounds uh, from students in the class. Uh, and that's why it's because it's kind of fun and easy to do this. We just say something like that. Uh, that's the clicking sound I'm talking about where air is rushing into your mouth. So ingressive means it's rushing into your mouth. And then the velaric part of it, it just means that you're making a velar closure uh, at all times to make this happen. Uh, and then the last step here would be to release this velar stop closure. And this is kind of the tricky part of it because um, this gets um, represented in the transcription of these things. But uh, you may or may, may or may not hear this velar release burst. Um, so you're going to lower your the back of your tongue as you kind of conclude the articulation of this um, segment. Um, but whether or not you hear it depends on whether or not you've been building up air pressure behind the velar um, closure. So you can make a and there's no K involved in that at all. You don't hear any like that, right? You just hear you hear that release of that forward stop closure. So this kind of velar stop remains silent throughout, but it's there. There's no other way to make this sort of um, sound in speech. Uh, yeah, so for I'll talk more about this, but for this reason, because you're making this stop closure, these sounds are typically transcribed with a K in front of them, but I'll give you all the different symbols we have for these click sounds that um, just vary depending on um, their place of articulation. So uh, the bilabial one looks like a circle with a dot in the middle, and it's kind of uh, like a lip smacking sound. Uh, uh. Uh, uh. And I'll say as we walk through this, these are examples of Peter Latifogan trying to produce all of them, uh, that uh, he's going to put them in a vowel click vowel context. Um, and normally, it's not super difficult for students to just make these sounds on their own, like something like that. It can take a little bit of practice to get them in the middle of uh, sort of pomonic egressive speech because you have to sort of change the direction of the airflow and so on and so forth. Uh, that may take you some practice, but with time, you should find that it's not super difficult to do. Like, ah, 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 ah. You can slow it down a lot, like, ah, ah, something like that. And then just speed it up, ah, 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 ah. Or if you want to make a dental click, ah, ah, ah. The dental is sort of that shame on you sound. Uh, the post alveolar sound is that kind of louder clicking sound that I demonstrated before. Uh, uh. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you can use that to, I guess, communicate with horses, something like that. Palatal alveolar or post alveolar would be a little bit further behind that. Uh. Uh, it's not super easy for me to do. You got to practice some of these. And this one will sound a little bit like the alveolar lateral will sound a little bit like a la. Uh, 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 something like that. Um, yeah, uh, again, these will take practice no matter uh, what you do to put them in that context and as well to get that different place of articulation too. Um, so there are symbols for these at five different places of articulation where they have me make meaningful contrasts in the languages of the world. And I guess I will say that basically in terms of where we find these sounds in language, uh, is only in Southern and Central Africa. And in particular, they're found in the Khoisan languages, uh, which actually is a combination of two distinct uh, families, one the Khoi languages and the other is the San languages. Um, and uh, that's where these sounds are found sort of natively. Uh, and then from those languages, they have actually spread out to other language families in the um, general region of Southern and Central Africa. Um, so they've had some influence on other languages, uh, even though they're kind of unique to that. Part of the world itself. So here's some examples from O. Um, so I've got all five different places of articulation here, and this is a native speaker of the language, not Peter Latifoged. Uh, it's spoken in Botswana. Um, and here we go. You can try to uh, sing along with these. Uh, I'll let you have the honor of doing this set. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, so... <laughs> uh, the first time I ever taught this class, I used these samples in a production exercise uh, and then had people record it in class. So I had a like, whole class of 50 students just saying things like, uh, 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 for a good 15 minutes. It was kind of fun. Um, anyways, uh, O is also a tone language. 
Uh, so you're getting tones on top of these, which are what these diacritics on top of the vowels are all about. Uh, and also why you got that kind of characteristic pitch contour uh, so on and so forth all right um just so you know again by convention the way these are transcribed is that we have a k symbol in front of the click so here's our bilabial click symbol the circle with the dot in the middle this straight up and down line is the dental click symbol but each one of these has a k in front of it to say that we're making a k closure a velar stop closure that's voiceless and unheard um, as we're producing these. And to be honest, now that I'm thinking about it, it would make, um, well, it would kind of make sense to like put that unreleased um, diacritic on the K, but you eventually do release it, but without any sort of audible release. So it would kind of be useful to put that there as well. Um, but as far as I know, that's not how it's conventionally transcribed. So I'm just gonna give you sort of the official way of doing it. Uh, but don't be confused when you listen to these, like this, alveolar click sound here in the middle, you're not hearing ka. There's no K sound after it. It's just the click. Uh, Hopefully you can hear that. Uh, it's not a, like an injective or anything velar. That part is silent. We just transcribe it. Um, yeah, these are the five different places of articulation for clicks. I think I'll just walk through that because we've talked about them already. Um, it's pretty it's relatively, relatively easy to understand where your tongue might be as you produce these things. Um, the tricky part is kind of linking that up to what you hear when other people produce them, um, especially if you're not used to listening to them. So all clicks are very high in acoustic intensity. intensity and what I mean by that is that they're loud, like <coughs> yeah, I can produce that pretty loudly. Um, alveolar clicks and palatal clicks or I think they're transcribed as post alveolar um, in that first set I showed you, but those have a uh, relatively transient or short release. And that's just the click itself. Yeah, and that one's not working. Yeah, I kind of have to focus on the palatal, so I won't say it too much so as not to mislead you, but it sounds like this. Um, so, those go by very briefly and are very loud. The dental and bilabial clicks have an affricated release, so it sounds like kind of a stop and then like some messiness after it. So this is with the front of your tongue, and this is the lip smacking sound. So those kind of sound contrastively different between these, which are just sharp spikes of sound. And then the laterals are somewhere between. Um, so that may help give you a guide for how to distinguish these when you do a transcription exercise with them, should that ever happen. Um, I've got this other demo here, which is kind of fun. Um, so here's something which can happen if you listen to clicks in connected speech as they're actually produced in language. Uh, you may experience a phenomenon known as perceptual streaming. Uh, so I'll play these um, clips and then just uh, ask if you, or I can't really ask you directly in this video, but um, ask you to think about if anything sounds funny as this, uh, these clips are going by. Yeah, so I got these clips. Uh, I'll play the second one in here in a second. I got these clips from um, this website, which unfortunately no longer seems to exist, and I should have written down what language it is. But I think these are actually field recordings from uh, back in the day, like in the 30s or 40s of a language which is no longer spoken. Uh, and I'll mention here that uh, basically most, if not all, the Khoisan languages are endangered uh, and are spoken only by a few speakers, or generally speaking, um, most of them are only spoken by a few speakers. So uh, these are uh, really, you know, cool sounds in the inventory of the world's languages, but unfortunately uh, they're in danger of fading away. Uh, so it's great to go out and do field work and just, you know, make sure you document them at least. Um, if not, try to help, you know, uh, the uh, language and the culture survive to whatever extent you can. Um, I think uh, what I was going to say though, is that um, there are a lot of alveolar clicks in this first sample here, uh, and I think there are a lot more dental clicks in the second one. 
Nalala zingungu li komi zita ingwe. Ito koka loku li kapu mkafele. La kubu kikolo li kabana loka. Um, but if you're like me and when you first hear these, uh, it may kind of sound like, you know, there's a guy speaking and then there's like clicks happening somewhere else. Um, because I guess your minds are just not used to listening to these two together. Uh, so it's kind of hard to like put them in the same place perceptually. Uh, that's what I mean by perceptual streaming. That's part of what your mind has to do when you perceive speech or any other kind of sound is figure out where things are coming from. Uh, and these, I guess, uh, sounds are basically so acoustically distinct from pulmonic egressive sounds that our mind has a hard time kind of stringing the two together. Um, yeah, so. So on and so forth. I'm not going to walk you through all that again. Uh, I will talk a little bit about some deep thought questions, though. So number one, do you think it's possible to make a voiced click? I uh, don't know what you think, whether yes or no. Um, I've gotten both answers in the past, but the answer in this particular case is yes, you can make a voiced click. Uh, and you can think about that in terms of like what's happening behind the click sound itself. What's going on with that velar stop closure? Um, we transcribe it, as I've shown you before, as a K, uh, but you could just make it voiced and then it would become like a G sound, right? Um, so yeah, you can voice on top of making a click um, as long as you keep that back further back stop um, voiced as you make the click sound it's the two air flows should not sort of interfere with each other number two is it possible you can aspirate a click and for the exact same reasons the answer is yes but the thing with an aspirated click is that the aspiration kind of has to happen after you release the click and the stop closure behind it so yeah you can sort of do that you just can't do it really at the same time number three is it possible to make a nasal click and the answer to this one is definitely yes. Uh, and I will say that I know this because uh, I have a feeling that some of you out there, when you try to make these clicks for your production exercise, will actually make nasal clicks because for some reason that's uh, an easier way for people to kind of walk into this. So you can kind of think about that if you go back to uh, our little diagrams here. So yeah, you want to keep this back closure closed and then release this to make the click like, um, and then uh, what often happens, I guess, is that, you know, for people who want to say like, uh, uh, and put this click in between two pulmonic egressive sounds is that by making sort of a nasal sound for this velar stop, um, it, they can keep that pulmonic egressive airflow going while they sort of superimpose clicks on top of that. So like, mm, like that. Uh, and like I said, a lot of students do that when they're producing their clicks for their production exercises. And I'll just let you know, try not to do that when you're making these. Do whatever you can to just keep that thing uh, voiceless or not nasal if it's not supposed to be nasal. Um, but basically I think that's what's happening is that you don't want to interrupt that uh, pulmonic aggressive airflow while you're getting this velaric ingressive airflow going and it's just easy if you kind of do both at the same time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so on and so forth so that's both voiced and nasal so that is no problem and i'll show you some examples from languages which make contrast in that regard uh in a second um, and then I've got a fourth question here. Is it possible to make an ejective click? And the answer to that is sort of as well. So and it's sort of for the same reason that number two is sort of. Uh, but if you make an ejective, you're making an ejective with that velar stop behind the click. Um, so you're releasing that with an ejective release uh, after you make the click sound itself. Uh, and these sounds are not super easy for um, a non click language speaker like myself to um, just produce on the fly. So I'm not going to try. I'm going to have. Um, uh, some samples of a native speaker doing that in a second. But I will say that um, I had a friend in grad school uh, by the name of Amanda Miller, uh, who grew up in New Jersey uh, and was just, a, I guess, a you know, regular New Jersey kid. Uh, and But she was inspired to go join the, um, so a native English speaker, and she was inspired to go and join the Peace Corps uh, after she graduated from college and they sent her to uh, Namibia where they speak a language called Shinhwasi. Uh, hopefully I got that right. Um, and uh, she didn't speak the language at all, but it's a click language. 
Uh, and she got uh, out there into uh, the work she was involved with through the Peace Corps, and she learned how to speak the language um, during her time in Namibia. So without knowing anything ahead of time about it, uh, she was able to sort of master the production of all these various segments, and some of them are um, fairly complicated. And then she had a um, fruitful career as a um, academic phonetician for many years after that as well. Um, so, you know, you never know how life is... Uh, going to turn out exactly, uh, but it may involve some clicks. So here's some examples of Zulu clicks. Uh, Zulu is spoken in South Africa. So Zulu is not a uh, Khoisan language uh, per se, but it's been influenced by them uh, such that it has these click sounds because the clicks are spoken in um, a variety of languages in the neighborhood of Zulu. Uh, so it, the legend, I guess, is that the, the female speakers of Zulu um, picked up on the click sounds. They incorporated them into their own language so that, you know, Supposedly, the men would not be able to understand them when they were speaking. Uh, but now everybody in Zulu has clicks. So, you know, I guess the men figured it out eventually. Go figure. Anyways, here's what Zulu clicks sound like. Uh, and these are with different sort of accompaniments, uh, including sort of voiceless clicks, aspirated clicks, voiced clicks, and then nasal clicks. Kaga. And these are the dentals. Kaga. Here's an aspirated dental. Kaga. Voiced. Toba and nasal. And it's fun to give these a shot at home as well. Um, I'll embarrass myself by trying it here. Something like that. Uh, here are the alveolar laterals. So you can try those if you want. Uh, but basically, there are distinctions being made here for clicks at the same place of articulation based on what's going on independently of the click itself. So um, if you are aspirating after you release that velar stop, then you put an H after that in the transcription. If you're voicing it, then you change the K to a G symbol. If you've made that a voiced nasal, then it's an angma, not a K or a G. Um, so I've got some examples of this sort of thing as well with Jun uh, which is the language that my um, friend Amanda studied for many years. I'm, I'm pretty sure she still knows. Uh, but here's a voiced uh, click. Ba. And a voiceless one. Kibi. Aspirated one. Kani. A na nasal. Nama. And then it's also got an affricated. So this is that ha sound again. Kara. And then it's also affricated ejective. Um. Uh, and that's what that sounds like. So you can make an ejective click and it sounds like this. Um. Uh, yeah, I'll mention here as well, as long as we're on this topic, that uh, the, the language uh, um, was the language that was used in an old film called The Gods Must Be Crazy, uh, which I watched when I was a kid and was impressed by at the time. Um, uh, so you hear a lot of clicks in that movie. If you ever want to check it out, it's relatively easy to find uh, and you might enjoy it as well. Um, although it might help to be a kid as you watch it. So anyways, uh, that's kind of neat. Uh, and that's all, basically all I have to say about Airstream mechanisms. So I will go back to my scoreboard so that you uh, haven't lost faith in that. But basically, um, clicks are, sorry, wrong. Clicks are velaric ingressive. So air is flowing into your mouth based on what you're doing with your velum as you make the sound. <coughs> we don't have... Um, velaric egressive sounds in some sort of meaningful way in language. Uh, so I'm going to put that those are unattested um, in this table here. Uh, I have heard that supposedly you can get this, um, some versions of French, like sounds like that basically, uh, would be velaric egressive where you're pushing the air out after making a velar, velar, yeah, velar stop. Uh, and you get that sound a lot like if you're doing like beatboxing and that's a very poor version of beatboxing but yeah you can get those too as well whatever i gotta quit while i'm behind uh but it's possible to make those we just don't get them in language and with that amount of embarrassment in my rearview mirror i'm gonna stop put an end to this lecture and next time we'll talk about how to make trills in language it will hopefully be just as much if not more fun so i'll see you then